Yeah, so that's a short, sharp breath that hits the throat. And at that moment, you are full of air with a sudden hit, with the ego displaced. And then, of course, um, you would either suffocate or breathe out. So, of course, if you're breathing out, in this case, you now from the top of the lungs first, then the center, and then from the bottom first. Uh, with no ego, then you'll have prepared yourself to receive what is there in front of you and see what is there. Um, yeah, so that is the ego displacement breath. Now, in the case of the um, um, breath used to release problems in the um, Berkeley uh, barrier breaker, <clears throat> the the person has a petrified posture. They have a, a character armoring. They have something an electrical field stuck in the muscles, so the muscles are not flexible and moving. So actually, every petrified posture is interfering with um, their breathing patterns, with their circulatory patterns. It affects their heart. Um, you know, it affects their emotions. It affects the energy, and it affects their breathing. Uh, for thousands of years, it was believed that the center of emotions is the heart. And um, then some, in discovering all the heart pumps, blood, how could it be the seat of emotions? Well, it feels like the seat of emotions is in, at the level of the heart. The function of the heart would be to bring energy to every part of the body without judgment which is a very heartful idea. And um, even though it was for time thought unscientific to think such ideas as like someone died of a broken heart uh, when there was an extreme emotional problem, the fact is that has now recently been discovered as physically it really does happen. Um, in rare cases, even from suddenly having to do public speaking, but more commonly because a loved one died or some sudden huge emotional loss, um, there's a condition where the heart physically changes shape to uh, the shape like a Japanese um, vase that holds flowers. It physically becomes twice as big, alters its shape, and people have actually died of it. You know, the heart does physically change its rhythm and its shape based on emotions. So, um, it wasn't just fantasy that um, the emotional mind is centered around the heart. And, you know, conditions like anxiety, shock, or like um, um, a neo-traffic accident instantly changes your breathing, instantly changes your heart rate. Um, you know, there will be visualizations with it. Oh, how great I'm alive, like I didn't go over that cliff um, because I narrowly escaped the car on the wrong lane. And here I am, how great I'm alive. So there'll be a variety of emotions. There'll be a, a many changes of breathing um, and many changes of the action of the heart, but um, it can be physically, measurably vast, the difference of the size, shape, and rhythm of the heart, depending upon the emotional state. So where the person is in a petrified posture, um, which is really there with almost everything that comes out of their mouth, because almost everything that comes out of their mouth is a limitation. Almost everything that comes out of almost everybody's mouth is something that they can't do. It's a limitation, saying what's hard to believe. 
uh, what will happen if something tomorrow it was so sad something happened yesterday this other person has a problem how they every one of those is a petrified posture which is uh, interfering with your blood circulation your nervous energy and your breathing so um, in the technique the person is exaggerating the energy of the petrified posture, which of course means they are finally conscious how they are petrifying their own self. Turning their petrify is turned to rock. They're turning their own like petrified wood is used to be a tree and now it's a rock. And um, they're petrifying their own self uh, from some old idea, and the petrified posture holds the idea and it's holding back their breathing. So. You're not just changing it by breathing, you're changing it by making it worse, which means consciously doing it. Consciously doing what was automatic. Now that you're consciously doing what was automatic, uh, the easiest access to change it is your breathing. Um, maybe you could dance. Maybe you could sing, but you cannot sing without breathing, you cannot dance without breathing, and everyone is welcome to dance and sing while they breathe in releasing a petrified posture, or whatever movement the body uses is, is there. But the, the one that's specified is breathing. Why? Because if you want to release a petrified posture and you go, like you just, like you make the same breath as you're desperate because the world has no meaning, which, which is a breath only at the top of the lungs. You're not filling with energy right down to the diaphragm. Well, you won't release anything uh, unless you do breathe down deep. Uh, now, if you actually decided to release, that decision would have you breathe deep. But to help you make the decision, the instruction and the exercise, uh, is a three-stage breath, which is like uh, basically the, uh, the three-stage ideas from pranayama, you know, to fill yourself up with the energy of the universe, uh, which is the diaphragm uh, being dome-shaped becomes straight, so that pulls itself down by straightening, which uh, brings in a huge amount of air into the bottom of the lungs uh, and the middle, and then the, the ribs will move and you will fill up to the top, and often also the other muscles like the scalene muscles, um, you know, connecting the neck to the back will often move as well. And more typically those upper muscles are not part of normal breathing but when you're running or exercising, like when you need more air, then some extra muscles come into play. So by having the, the exercise of making it worse, exciting, let's really release it. You're getting the same amount of activation as if you're running and doing a really strong exercise. So without thinking, you will be using the extra muscles of breathing, which normally only take part when you're doing heavy exercise. But if I told you, like the instruction were to use your scaling muscles, where are they? How do I use them? Well, the fact is they come into play when it's big and it's exciting. So uh, we don't have to specify those muscles, but we do have to specify the diaphragm. Because um, if you say, take a deep breath, and the person goes, like, you know, just my shoulders moved up and my ribs contracted and I took in air from the top of my lungs. Now, so if, if, I, if, if people understand by take a deep breath, now first the diaphragm and then here, you suddenly feel full of the universe. And things start to, you start to, you're able to believe in change. Um, 
So even if in the process of, to release a particular posture you have to do some antics and <laughs> you know, whatever breathing also happens, you're never going to release it unless um, you really uh, fill the lungs up from really deep and up. And or every petrified posture is stopping you from breathing so deep. Every petr petrified posture is interfering with your breathing. Um, so by uh, consciously um, using the full classic pranayama three stage you know, diaphragm center top of the lungs and now you're going to release it um, uh, fully Um, then the variations necessary for that particular posture don't need to be taught. You know, feel free to dance and sing. You know, in Brazil they will dance on tables. Um, don't have plastic tables in a workshop room in case they dance on them, releasing things. Um, you know, so it's a breath in which you know you're now participating in your presence as a flowing part of the universe instead of an isolated part, because in all cases, depression, uh, even though there's many ways of describing what depression is, and people use the word in whatever way they do, still, in all definitions, the person is feeling isolated. And a full breath here, the person will not be feeling so isolated. Isolated from life now, isolated from life in the past, isolated from all the things I were told that uh, cannot um, happen. Yeah, so that's the basic um, brain trainer um, three stage breath with its intuitive counterparts at the end. Now, in the case of the um, uh, doing something different exercise, um, you know, liberating difficult people. Well, typically there will be some breathing which you which is um, similar to the problem that you think the other person has, and then you're shifting that to something else. And then that will um, shift the situation in both people. Um, so the main thing in that will be allowing a different breath than normal. Um, and that might, might be any change. Um, but the basic concept is noticing how you are breathing, thinking, visualizing, and change it. So if uh, the image is um, that person with a aggressive face, your thought is he's an idiot, and your breathing is shallow. Well you will um, see some genius in him, because that's different than he's an idiot. Uh, you will um, see his aggressive face as he's an actor, because that's different than his face is aggressive, he's a good actor, is a, di is a, a different thought. And let your breathing be different and your breathing might be ready for action, like to hit him back, but he is not even hitting you anyway, it's only a look. But people have this look and they're ready to hit back because we're so used to, so used to, uh, for like a few million years, reacting to the other animals and the, reacting in these ways that no longer have any meaning. So we uh, need to update our reactions to the moment 
So the person changes from idiot to genius, they change from aggressive to actor, and you change from victim who's justified at hitting back to um, dancer, for example. So then you're, you, 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 you will be allowing multiple breathing shifts You'll be more aware of your breathing and noticing how it's changing. You won't be trying to change in one particular way with the difficult people exercise, but you'll be celebrating in the difference of your breathing, uh, whatever that might be. Um, now, in the case of trances, when a client is in a deep trance, Almost always, the therapist is breathing the three-stage breath in line with the patient, in sympathy with the patient. Um, that is not usually necessary to decide to do, although it's done with NLP tricks for um, uh, you know empathy exercises. Um, you know, to practice, one breathes in tune with the other person. But when you're actually good at it, you just are breathing in tune with the other person without actually thinking about it. And that just is natural. And your client will be breathing even deeper in tune with your breathing because you are in tune with their breathing and both will go deeper. So in that case it will be without rehearsing but a three stage breath from the diaphragm and very uh, very full breaths because you're filling the entire body and then they will change at various stages. Um, you know, because if the client is releasing um, a terror from the past well then with um, uh, terror desolation, normally the person um, breathes in <gasps> and then <gasps> like <gasps> like their short breaths trying to push something out and, um, and if you actually copy that breath for as long as one minute uh, you'll really feel like the world is coming to an end, even if you're happy before, if you just change the breathing of a desperate person. Um, so, of course, in a trance helping someone, you might shift from this deep breathing to... Um, <gasps> yeah, so you might shift into a desperate breath and it's smoothly changes to the deep yoga breath. Um, you would never use the uh, negative emotion breath for more than a short number of sessions in a deep trance. But for the client to feel understood, it very often will be necessary that you um, have moved into their breath. Um, however, if you're using such breaths for therapeutic purposes, uh, you will um, need to set the visualization that you're doing this change to free somebody, not to be clever and feel how bad they are. You know, that's, while that's very normal in therapy, it's destructive. Um, you know, to, to start to mirror the negative just because you're smart and you can see the negative. Well, you don't have to be smart to see the negative. Every insane person is great at seeing the negative. You don't, there's nothing clever about, I'm so intuitive, I know he has a problem with his father, like any idiot can do that, that's nothing. Uh, what you need is to start from a place of liberation and choose to suffer for the purpose of the person letting go. And that way you will be starting with a very full, expansive breath with the universe, which will shift to something desperate for a few seconds and smoothly changes out again. Uh, now, so that's a very uh, powerful technique of um, um, changing a life.
of uh, changes in the breadth. Um, other types, one other type of breath I've often mentioned in workshops, which is not uh, usually a part of a workshop, but just how it's recorded. Um, we could call it the, uh, choir, the, the choir breath. Um, you know, the story where Milton Erickson, uh, everything about Milton Erickson is paradoxical. No one really knows, um, was the mythology real or not, because he's one of our great mythological psychologists. And, um, however, Milton Erickson, as the story goes, was tone deaf, um, it's a little hard to find out exactly what tone deaf means scientifically. The closest word I know is vocal motor amusia, vocal you know, of the voice motor of the nerves uh, that control muscles, amusia, not musical. Like that someone that can't control the, the pitch of the voice and sing easily. Um, I can't yet find what the term is for what that people usually mean when they say tone deaf, which is uh, they sing out of tune happily and they don't even know they're singing the notes so wrong that they're torturing other people. I have no idea why, but it's more common in uh, spiritist churches than in any other place I've been. I, can't, I, can't, I don't yet find the connection, but they often sing hymns quite out of tune and look happy. Yeah, so that was Milton Erickson's impression of the church choir. And how do they look happy when they, when they sound so awful? So the story is he was tone deaf and it wasn't the choir, it was him. And so he came to the conclusion they were breathing together. So what is the breath together in a church choir? Well, typically there are four bars of music in a line with four beats each. Occasionally it's three, but usually churches are not singing waltzes, as in one, two, three, one, two, three. You know, typically there's four beats to a bar, 16, four bars, and then there's the next line. So, um, <clears throat> if, so the choir, in order to sing, has to breathe in quickly. So they can breathe out for 16 beats. So if a group of people were to breathe the same as a breath as a church choir, so they breathe in half a beat because you don't, you can't breathe in slowly and relax because you'd miss the, miss the word, right? So the church choir has to use the breath that shocks out the ego. 